Well, hello and welcome once again to our Bible study coming to you on behalf of Campbellsville Baptist Church here in the heart of Campbellsville, Kentucky, 420 North Central Avenue. My pastor is Dr. Dwayne Norman. My name is Dr. Terry Wilder, and we would like to invite you to visit our church at any time. We would love to get to know you on Sunday morning. Uh, our Sunday school starts at 9.15 a.m., and we have several Sunday school classes from which to pick. And on Sunday morning, our worship services are at 10.30 a.m. On Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock, we have prayer and Bible studies, and you're welcome to come to that as well. We would love to get to know you and help you in your walk with the Lord, and it's always great to get to know somebody new and to see a a new face and be able to help somebody uh, with whatever they might be going through. Well, we are nearing the end of our study on future things. And when we last met, we talked about the purpose of the millennium. We were in Revelation 20. And we also saw this resurrection, second resurrection. The second resurrection being a resurrection of unbelievers. And John says that he saw them... Uh, uh, the dead, both small and great, and they were to come before uh, the Lord and uh, their names, uh, to see if their names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so that's where we left off. So now we want to talk about the great white throne judgment. So John says this in Revelation 20, in verse uh, uh in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, he sees the he sees the dead. He sees the dead, both small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And then another book, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That's in verse 12 of Revelation 20. So let me summarize this time rather briefly. Uh, these unbelievers now have been resurrected. They've been resurrected, uh, and this passage makes quite a bit of the fact that no one will escape this uh, judgment. Regardless of where a man died or under what conditions, he'll make it to this event. And he stands there, and the books are open. In other words, God brings forth a complete detailed remembrance of this man's life, everything that he ever did. And he's given an opportunity. He's given his date in court, as it were, to show that he is fit to spend eternity in the, the presence of God. But as the books are opened, and as his life is spread before him, it becomes painfully obvious that he doesn't have anything to present to God as making him worthy to spend eternity in his presence. So, God says, there's a second possibility. If you can't produce righteousness on your own, then you were given the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, my son, as your Savior and accept the righteousness which he provides by grace through faith. And this, I think, is, uh, is what is meant by the presence of the book of life. That's how I would picture it. But unfortunately, these people aren't found there in the book of life. So in essence, there are two possible wave, ways to be saved. Now don't misunderstand me uh, here when I say this uh, at this point. The Apostle Paul talks about the same thing in the second chapter of the book of Romans. The basis of God's judgment is works in the sense that every man will be held accountable. And if you're going to get to heaven on your own, you're going to have to produce a perfect righteousness. A perfect righteousness that um, uh, in works. And if you can, God will accept you. But the Bible makes it very clear that you can't. The first part of Romans chapter 3, you remember, says there's none that doeth righteousness. 
We've all gone our own way. We've all turned aside. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seek after God. And therefore, the only reliable living possibility is the righteousness, the righteousness which God provides through faith in Jesus Christ. Because if you're hanging your hopes on the first option, your own righteousness, you're going to be sadly disappointed because nobody in the history of the human race has ever made it on his own works, and the Word of God says nobody is yet going to. There's only one person who has ever lived who was sinless, and that was Jesus Christ. Therefore, the only option is that we receive the righteousness which God has provided in Christ. And if, if you have received that righteousness, then you are written in the Lamb's book of life, which is a symbolic way, I think, of saying, a symbolic way, I think, of saying that you've been enrolled in heaven amongst the saved. These other people, however, cannot produce righteousness through their own works, and they did not receive Christ as their Savior, and therefore nothing is left for them except for the lake of fire, which is called the second death. We see that in the uh, the latter part of Revelation 20 and verses 14 and, and, and then also in 15. Verse 15 of Revelation 20 is one of the most solemn and awesome verses in all of Scripture. Whoever, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I mean, whenever you read that verse, you, um, you might think of the contrast uh, the, between it and John 3.16, because both of them contain the word whosoever. Whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, now that's not a pleasant topic. Uh, I don't know many people who actually like to talk about this, but it, it's not something we enjoy talking about or studying, but it's just as much a part of of the Word of God as the New Jerusalem, heaven, and all the things that God has prepared for believers. And therefore, if we accept the one, we've got to accept the other of necessity. And it's our duty as Christians to warn men of this fate which awaits them if they refuse the righteousness of God which is in Christ. So here's the great, great uh, white throne judgment of unbelievers from which the unbelievers are cast into the lake of fire and they are there from then on i don't find uh, anything in scripture which gives them a second chance anything which eventually results in universalism um, anything which suggests some sort of a purgatory from which they might eventually emerge as far as i can see the same terminology which characterizes heaven as being eternal also characterizes hell as being eternal, and therefore it's a solemn, awesome, terrible prospect which we should warn people about. However, we would now look on the other side of the picture, just very briefly now, a word on chapters 1, 21 and 22 of the book of Revelation. Uh, I'll provide a, a very brief summary um, before we uh, we close, I'll try to do that just before we close our, our study. Revelation chapters 21 and 22 present a picture of the eternal state, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. Chapter 21 uh, opens and it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now, incidentally, um, uh, here um, in the, this uh, uh, passage, I think that many uh, of these passages uh, that uh, are in, in the Old Testament are sometimes misinterpreted uh, because people take them to be millennial passages, um, passages where it says the wolf uh, will uh, dwell with the uh, lamb, um, you know, where the, the calves and the young lion feed together, where the child plays upon the den of the cobra and so on. I mean, this is frequently taken to mean the millennium as though the millennium were a time when all of these peaceful conditions exist. But I don't think this is correct. 
Uh, you remember that the curse which God has placed upon nature uh, in Genesis chapter 3 was connected with the fall of man when God put the curse upon Adam and the human race. He put the corollary curse upon the natural creation, upon the earth itself, briars and thistles and thorns and the ferocity of animals and all the rest of it. Now, Romans chapter 8 makes it very clear, make very plain, that the curse upon nature will not be uh, lifted until the curse upon man is lifted. And when the curse on man is lifted, humanity is lifted, the sinful nature is removed, and sin itself becomes a thing of the past. Now, although uh, we're a little vague as to precisely what goes on during the millennium. We're not vague as to what goes on at the close of the millennium because we've already seen that there is the greatest rebellion in history, which is called the Gog-Magog Rebellion uh, here. And uh, there is the greatest opposition and rebellion against God that the earth has yet seen, probably. Now, how, how could all of these people rebel against God if they still didn't have an Adamic nature and were living in sin? Well, obviously, uh, they couldn't. Therefore, if men at the end of the millennium are still with the sinful nature, st still have sinful natures, uh, still rebelling against God, that is, those who don't uh, know him, then the curse upon the earth and upon its inhabitants has not yet been lifted. And the curse, I'm convinced, is not lifted until the old heaven and the old earth are passed away. Chapter 21, verse 1. And in their place, there's the new heaven and the new earth. And so therefore, when you read all of these passages in the Old Testament about the lamb lying down with the lion and all of these that I've just mentioned earlier, I think that those verses are actually speaking of the eternal state, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, the time after the millennium and not the millennium itself for the reasons that I've just mentioned. John saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And then I heard a great voice, he says, out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So here is the final, the final fulfillment of the promise that started all the way back in the Old Testament concerning the tabernacle of God with men. In Israel, God tabernacled among his people by a indwelling through the Shekinah glory within the tabernacle. And later, the temple in the midst of his people. This was his dwelling in the midst of his people. It was a symbolic, figurative type thing. And then as we saw earlier today, uh, earlier in a, an earlier session rather, during this age in which we live, God is tabernacling, uh, tabernacling among his people by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit in each uh, believer and in the church corporately. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 uh, indicates this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. But even that is not the ultimate realization of the promise that God would tabernacle amongst his people. The ultimate realization is right here. When we get to the New Jerusalem, the holy city, we will actually live right in the very presence of God himself. And that is is the final fulfillment of that promise. And then notice the conditions that exist, which will exist in verse 4. These are precious verses. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. You know, I don't know how that affects you, but that makes uh, you know that that makes you want to leave right now and go there uh, today. Uh, uh, he'll wipe away all tears from their eyes. It's not without reason that that poets speak of our current life as being a veil of tears. Uh, but there shall be no more death. 
Do you realize how many millions upon countless millions of people have lived on planet Earth and, and died? Um, one of my uh, former mentors told about a, um, an experience that he had. He was uh, living in New York on one occasion, and he would have reason to drive up into Manhattan on the Long Island Expressway, which has been characterized by some as the world's largest parking lot, he would say. But anyway, how he avoided it whenever he could, but occasionally he had to go in that way. And uh, there's one stretch just before you get to the Midtown Tunnel, I guess it was three or four miles out from the town, which he said was the which was the largest cemetery that he had ever seen. It's not the Memorial Park type of, of a cemetery that we have so much of today. It was the old kind with the, the tombstone. And there was one place uh, where, as he recalled, that the freeway went right through the middle of it, the middle of the cemetery. They apparently had cut right through the middle of the cemetery, and as far as you could see on either side and backward and forward, all you could see, aside from the freeway itself, is the cemetery. And he said it was one of the most impressive sights that he had ever seen, and he often thought, uh, as he went through there, how in the world could a man drive through here every day, backward, back and forward, back and forward, and not eventually be impressed with the fact that one of the days he himself was going to die. I mean, you'd have to almost be totally oblivious uh, to what goes on around you to escape, to escape that. But in the new Jerusalem, in the new Jerusalem, in the new heavens and the new earth, there shall be no more death. Oh, praise God for that. Neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. Now, I don't know how many this would apply to today, but there are people who have lived most, if not all, of their lives in pain. And there are people who are close to some of us who are living with intense pain, even now. But there's coming a time when this will be a thing of the past, because sorrow and death and pain are all a part of the curse of sin upon the human race. And when that's removed, when that's removed, then all of these go with it. He that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write these words, write, for these words are true and faithful. So that's just a very brief glimpse of the new Jerusalem, the holy city, in the uh, the moments that we have left in our future things session. But I want to call your attention, first of all, to verse 12, which says that the city had a wall, great and high, with twelve gates, and on these gates are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. In verse 14, the wall has twelve foundation stones. We're still in Revelation uh, chapter 21. Twelve foundation stones, and on them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. This, I sp think, speaks in figurative language, and we must see the figurative, symbolic language in this passage. This speaks the fact that both both the, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament saints of God are going to be in this city, this new Jerusalem. This is going to be the dwelling place of the saints of God of all the ages. Abraham will be there, and Moses will be there, and Noah will be there, and Elijah will be there, and Paul and Peter and James and John will be there, and if you're a Christian, you will be there too. Then symbolically, there is a measurement given of the city, and in verse 16, the city is described as being foursquare. And, and that I'm reading from the King James, and the length is as large as the breadth, and the height and the breadth and the length are all equal, 12,000 furlongs. In other words, the city is in the form of a cube. Uh, it is equally distant on the three sides. Now, I, I think that uh, this is, uh, that it's the best approach to take 12,000 furlongs and then take our little handy computer or calculator and multiply this out and come up with 1,300 uh, some odd miles and then point out that it's as big as from here 
uh, say, to Miami, to New York, to Chicago, and so on. I, I, I really think that's the point. That, that misses the point to, to recommend that as the 12, uh, as the best approach. I really think that what this is to convey when, when uh, John mentions this is this. There's only one building in the history of God's people that was formed as a perfect cube, and that was the Holy of Holies in the Jewish temple. It was, it was a perfect cube. Now, I think that this is what this is intended to convey, is that the, these measurements, that is, that the Holy of Holies in the temple was the place where the Shekinah glory, the glory of God, the very presence of God dwelt. But in the days of Israel, before the coming of Christ, the Israelites were not admitted into that room. Only the high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, with the blood of sacrifice, dared to go in. Now the picture is that all of the redeemed people of God of all the ages not only have the privilege of going in, but they're actually going to live there. They're going to live there. That's their home. The presence of God, the Holy of Holies, has now been expanded infinitely to become the eternal dwelling place of all of his people. And that is the most beautiful picture of the city, I think, that we... we um, we have in this uh, this passage. That is, that the Holy of Holies is expanded to accommodate all of the people of God. So I, I'm convinced that this is figurative because there's a wall around the city. It's 144 cubits high. 144 cubits, if you multiply it out literally, comes to around 200 feet. Now what uh, kind of protection could you have with a 200-foot wall around a city that's 1,300 miles high, as we talked about earlier? Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that it gets kind of absurd when you try to multiply all this out and then draw a picture of it. But this is symbolism. 144 is 12 times 12, which in the book of Revelation is a picture of completion, of totality. And this is a picture of absolute total perfection. So I don't think it's 200 feet uh, high. I don't believe there's a wall at all. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah, chapter 2, the prophet says that the wall around Jerusalem will be a wall of fire. Well now, let's make up our mind. Is it a wall of fire or is it this 200 foot real wall? And there's another passage in the Old Testament that says the Lord himself shall be a, a wall around it. Well, um, what is it then? A real wall, 200 feet, high, 200 feet high? Is it a rim of fire or is it the Lord himself? Well, in a sense, it's all of these that, because this is symbolism. This is poetic language. Notice just one or two other important points here in verse 22. There was no temple in the New Jerusalem, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple in it. So the temple represented the presence of God in the midst of his people. It isn't necessary anymore because God himself is in the midst of his people. There's no need for the moon or the sun because God himself and the land are the light of this city. In chapter 22, we have the picture of the pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, you can take this to be a real channel of water if you want to, but I think, again, this is symbolic. This is the water of life. This is what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 7 and verse 37 and following when he said, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And he that drinks out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Or in John chapter 4, when he told the woman at the well, If you drink of this water, you'll thirst again, referring to the water of the well. But if you'll drink the water that I give to you, Jesus said, you'll never thirst again. Spiritual water, the water of life, is um, what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 7, verse 37 and following, when he said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that drinks out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And also John 4, when he talked to the woman at the, at the well. So this is the water of life, the water of salvation, spiritual water. Now notice verse 3 in Revelation 22, and we're talking, we were talking about this a moment ago. 
There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. I get the impression as I read through these passages that even the Spirit of God found it difficult to express in human language any sort of adequate description of the New Jerusalem. It's expressed as a city made up of precious stones, it's, a, it's of gold, it's of silver or crystal. Uh, one person asked a question one time, well, isn't there going to be any grass? You know, aren't there going to be any trees there? I don't want to live in a place that's just made out of precious stones and metal and and uh, that uh, type of uh, thing. I think that John here, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and limited by human language, is trying to describe the most beautiful, the most desirable place that the human mind could possibly conceive. And I think that we should understand it in that sense rather than in, in an ultra-literalistic uh, sense. Now, I did say uh, that I'd try to pull it all together as best I can, and I'm not sure that I can in the time that we have left, but let me do the best I can as I understand it, the, uh, the end-time uh, events. We may be approaching, and I'm cautious about this because Bible teachers in World War I, and you know, they were freely predicting that the Kaiser was the Antichrist, and in World War II, they were sure that Mussolini and Hitler were the beast and the false prophet and so on. And, and therefore, you know, after, um, after people get burned a few times, uh, you, know, you know, we ought to learn something uh, after a while. So I'm not dogmatic and I'm not setting any dates. But when, whenever the end comes, these are things, I think, that are going to occur. And it may well be that we could be approaching this. I, I don't know. As I mentioned on an earlier occasion, there are some indications along this line, uh, in other words, signs that uh, we're, we're moving towards these things at the end times. But uh, we, so we have this movement toward a world government. We also have a movement towards a, a, a world religion. Uh, the movement uh, perhaps towards some sort of an ultimate weapon system. I talked about this in previous sessions. The movement towards apostasy, which we already see, you know, a great falling away. But as I understand the scriptures, the church of Jesus Christ, at least one generation, will live to see the manifestation of the man of sin, the Antichrist, who will become a world ruler and who will, for three and a half years, will be a benevolent dictator but who will, at that point, after three and a half years, will reveal himself as a satanic maniac who will instigate the greatest bloodbath, the greatest religious persecution in the history of the world, proclaiming himself as God, prescribing every other form of religion. And this will continue with great persecution, great martyrdom, until the actual return of Jesus Christ at the end of that period some uh, three and a half late, years later. And as a part of the return of the return of Jesus uh, of, of Christ, as a part of the return of Jesus Christ, the dead in Christ shall be raised and they shall receive glorified bodies, as Paul says in Philippians 3.20 and also verse 21. We will trade in these bodies of humiliation, humiliation for a body which is likened to his glorious body. So if you want to know what your resurrection body is going to be like, read what Jesus' resurrection body was like after his resurrection. Uh, these men are caught up together with the living that have changed to meet the have been changed to meet the Lord in the air as a welcoming party, as it were, and then the Lord returns to the earth. Well, I think we're going to have to stop there. I'll come back and re cap uh, this uh, all this again as we have uh, which uh, as we have what will be our last session uh, the next time uh, we meet in the meantime let's uh, let's pray father thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to study the scripture and lord we have tried to be careful not to reach any hasty eschatological conclusions about the end times uh, but we do rest in the fact that jesus christ is coming again and Lord, in the meantime, keep us faithful until he returns. And Lord, to help us to always be vigilant, always to be ready uh, for his return. And Lord, in the meantime, may we spread the gospel to all who need to hear. 
We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, until the next time that we meet, you uh, take care and uh, God bless. We're going to be finishing soon our study on future things. Bye now.